Well, as always, it's good to see everyone here this evening. We're glad you're here. Revelation chapter 17 is where we are continuing tonight. We got down through the first seven verses last time. As John saw this vision of the harlot that was sitting on the beast, uh, the harlot uh, who sits on many waters enthroned on this great and horrible beast, and we saw the description, and we tried to get a little sense of the symbolism of all of that last time, and we finished with verse 7 where the angel, after revealing all of this to John, says, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And as I tried to warn you last time, uh, this is difficult stuff. For some reason, the explanation's always worse than the original. And this one is like that in spades, as it were. This is a very difficult text in the book of Revelation. You'll hear me say, I don't know more than often, uh, I, I usually do uh, tonight, uh, but I think that I can provide some sense of the idea that uh, is being communicated to John, uh, we'll see. Uh, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. So the first thing we're told by way of explanation is that this beast is something that can be described as past and yet not in the present, was and is not, but is about to come up and go away into destruction. Seems to me that the first thing that would come to our minds as we've been reading the book is that this is some kind of an evil imitation of true deity. You remember the first thing that we saw in the book in chapter 1 and verse 4, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And here we have this beast described in that very same language with a little bit of a twist to it, was and is not, and yet is to come, but when he comes, he's only coming for the purpose of destruction. Uh, again, in chapter 1 and in verse 8, we saw that language, and I think we argued that this is Jesus here, Jesus the Alpha, the Omega, who is and was and is to come. And then again in chapter 4 and verse 8, in that great vision of the throne, uh, holy, holy, is the Lord God the Almighty who was and is and is to come. So this one is kind of like that. Was and is not and is about to come. And of course the fact that it is not is the interesting part, but it seems to me first of all that the message is that this is a parody of true deity, that whatever this thing is that we're looking at here is claiming or wanting to be recognized as divine, but really can't be described in those terms. It is therefore kind of an evil Messiah. Uh, we noted back in chapter 13 and verse 3 that when John saw the beast that had come up out of the uh, sea, that uh, it had one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Uh, that he was and is, in a sense. Uh, there's a little bit of that seemingly going on here as well, and that suggests to us that this is John again talking about the situation of the original readers, the Roman Empire and its oppressive emperor cult. And instead of this thing rising from the grave, the way Jesus rose from the grave, this thing rises from the abyss, and of course, we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, but instead of rising to reign the way the Lamb did, the way Jesus did, this one only rises or comes to be destroyed. And so it is language that is almost mocking the pretension of the beast and the pretension of Rome, it seems to me. Um, and uh, there might be something else to that. There was a sense in which the Roman kingdom was and at the same time is not. 
It appeared to be the greatest kingdom in the world, but it wasn't. And when people looked at it, they could say, yes, this kingdom has been here for a long time. The Romans believed uh, that their, their kingdom went back to 800, about 853 B.C. And so people would look at it and say, look at this great kingdom that has this great history. But John says, well, there might have been a time when it was the greatest kingdom in the world, but it cannot be called that any longer. Uh, or some have suggested that it is not in an anticipatory sense, that uh, it's not going to last very long. You really can't speak of it as, uh, as an uh, abiding kingdom because it's going to be so quickly destroyed. Or others have suggested that what it means is that Rome uh, had gone through a period where its power had waned. Uh, if you know anything about the history of the first century, you know that uh, up until the time of Claudius, things were pretty good for the Roman Empire. During the time of Nero and the year after him, things pretty much fell apart. Uh, Roman was uh, The Roman uh, aristocracy in the Senate hated Nero. After Nero died, there was kind of a free-for-all. The government was in danger of actually collapsing. There were three different men who became emperors of Rome in the next year after Nero died. And then finally, when Vespasian came along, he brought some stability and order to the kingdom again. And so some have suggested that that is the idea that it was and is not and is about to come, that Rome is getting its act together again. Um, either one of those explanations would work, uh, and I'm not sure exactly which one of those I would recommend, but whatever approach you take to that, it seems to me that the point is that there was something that the people in the first century could look at concerning this kingdom and they could look at its power, and they could describe it, the, the average pagan would describe it in divine terms, but John is kind of parodying that uh, description and saying, well, it's not what you think it is. Uh, it says that he is uh, going to come up out of the abyss. Uh, there's not much said in the Bible about the abyss other than to suggest to us that it is the abode of evil. It is where demonic spirits dwell. Uh, in chapter 9 and verse 11, uh, when those uh, trumpets were being sounded, we saw that uh, these locusts that came up have the king over them as the angel of the abyss. And in chapter uh, 11 and verse 7, we saw a reference to that as well. In Luke 8, 31, you remember that when Jesus approached a man who was possessed by a demon, the demon said, are you going to throw me into the abyss? And we're going to see later on in the book of Revelation that this is going to be the fate of these evil beings. And so this evil empire that is described as the beast... Uh, has come up out of the abyss. There's nothing good about it. Rome, of course, wanted to present itself as beneficent, as the savior of the world, doing a good thing for, for mankind. And, and John says, no, it's not that way at all. This is an evil power. And Satan is using it to fight God and his Messiah and his kingdom. And that's the way Christians ought to look at it. Uh, and so it is going to be destroyed and uh, those who do not have their name written in the book, that is, people who aren't believers and not children of God, uh, they are going to wonder about this. Uh, there's a lot said in the Bible, actually, about having a name written in the book of life. Uh, Moses mentions it in Exodus 32. Uh, it's mentioned in Philippians uh, and, and in earlier in Revelation. And it's simply a way of speaking about the security of the saved, that God knows their names, that God has written their names down. As far as God is concerned, they are his people. And it's supposed to give us a sense that, that we don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to make it. God has already written our names down. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't ever be lost. That would be taking that image way too far. But it's simply designed to encourage Christians. But those who aren't uh, God's people, we are told that they will wonder 
when they see this beast, particularly when they see that he was and is not and will come. So what is it that will be so amazing? And again, there's a couple ways to understand this. Um, it might just be so simple as to say that what is so amazing is that this kingdom could come to an end. That this kingdom that seemed so invincible and so strong and that had come back from the terror years of Nero and uh, uh, Otho Galba and uh, Gotha Albo and Vitellius, that uh, how could this kingdom ever fall? Uh, or similarly, some have suggested that what would be amazing to people is the recuperative power of this thing, kind of like the beast that we saw as he was described in 13.3, standing as if he had been slain. You can't kill this thing. It's strong, it's powerful, and for that reason it's like a government that nobody had ever seen before, causing maybe people to worship it as divine. We saw last time in the first part of chapter 17, that Roma was the personification of the Roman Empire. She was worshipped as a goddess in the provinces. And so something like this seems to me is kind of on the right track. The people are marveling at this beast, this empire, because of its great strength and its power. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay, that's not too hard. Although, immediately I think you can see that we're into something kind of tricky here. The dragon, the beast that she was riding on had seven heads. John says, well, the, the heads are mountains. So the symbol is a symbol of a symbol. <laughs> uh, it can get kind of tricky. But this double use of the uh, symbolism uh, is, of course, kind of uh, interesting. Uh, of course, Rome was always known as the city on seven hills. And so when we are told here that there are seven mountains on which this woman sits, I think that's a very clear indication that we're talking here about a description of Rome. And mountains in biblical language, are very often symbols of strength. Uh, in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, uh, we hear about the mountain of God. And the point is not just that there is a place that God might dwell, kind of like the pagan gods were thought to live on mountains. Uh, God is associated with the mountain because of its image of size and strength and power. Uh, we saw back in chapter 8 and verse 8, uh, as those uh, plagues were being unleashed back there, that something like a mountain, a great mountain, burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And we suggested back then that that is, again, another symbol of the destruction of the Roman Empire, like a great tall mountain that you could never chip away. It's now being thrown into the sea to disappear and the same uh, in 14.1, uh, a little bit different picture there, but we have the lamb standing on a mountain, Mount Zion. And he's not on a mountain just because of the scenery. He's on a mountain because the mountaintop is a symbol of strength. And so these mountains are not just geographical features, but they are symbols of the strength of this empire. And what I like about that explanation is that it would explain how the symbol can stand for both mountains and kings, as we're going to see here in the next verse. It says in verse 10 that these mountains are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain a little while. So the... Heads are mountains, which are kings as well. Uh, we actually get this in another place in the Bible, Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, where Daniel had a vision, uh, the vision of the four beasts, remember, that come up out of the earth, and they represent the four successive world kingdoms, just like Daniel 2. Um, but we were told that on the 
fourth beast that there were ten horns, and then later we're told in Daniel 7 that those ten horns are ten kingdoms. And what that probably means is that the Roman Empire would be a tremendously powerful empire, that it would have, uh, it would be a, a kingdom of kingdoms, as it were. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, John here says that they are seven kings. Five of them have already come and gone. One of them is for the moment, and the seventh one is not yet come, but when he does come, he will hold on and remain for a little while. And so the question that has been asked of this text ever since John wrote it is which seven kings or emperors of Rome are meant? Uh, these are the emperors or the leaders of the Roman Empire down through the first century. Uh, Julius Caesar, of course, is before the first century. He's in B.C., uh, but starting with Augustus going into the first century and Domitian going down to the end of the first century, you can see that we have uh, three, six, nine, twelve of them. And so the question is, which of these twelve are the seven that John is talking about? Um, if you start with Julius Caesar, you end up with Otho, and I don't know of anybody that takes that position. First of all, Julius Caesar is usually not counted as an emperor. Uh, the first emperor was Augustus, technically speaking. And nobody really counts Galba, Otho, and Vitellius as real emperors. Uh, they were the guys that all reigned in the year after Nero died. Each one of them was on the throne for just a few weeks. And uh, it was finally Vespasian that came along and brought stability back to the throne. And so it has been more common to count something like this, to start with Augustus, skip these three guys, and then uh, get down to Vespasian and Titus. Uh, but you can see the problem that there is no threat of persecution during the time of Vespasian and Titus. Uh, we have suggested, based on the ancient evidence, that this book was written during the time of Domitian, but Domitian would be number eight in this sequence. And so the question is, how do you number these things? And you would not believe the amount of ink that has been spilled over this. And I have come to the conclusion myself that there's probably not a way to figure that out. Uh, my understanding uh, at this point in time is that we probably don't need to figure out which seven of the 12 John is talking about. But John is simply making a connection between the emperors and the empire's power. Remember what he said, the ten horns, or the, the seven heads, excuse me, are seven mountains, symbols of strength. And these mountains can also be thought of as kings. And so I think what John is simply saying is that, these, that, that the power that lies in this kingdom is also directly uh, attributed to the men who reign over it. And remember the specific problem that we have been uh, using as kind of our interpretive key to this whole thing, that the crisis that was facing these Christians was the emperor cult. That they were sooner or later going to be told that you're going to have to worship the Roman emperor as a god which no faithful Christian could do. And so if you keep that kind of in the background, it seems to me that it shouldn't be very surprising that John connects the power of this empire with the kings or the emperors, because that's really what it was going to come down to for these Christians, a recognition of the deity and the power of those kings. Uh, there's another thing here going on, it seems to me, the fact that there are seven in this sequence, five that have been, one that is, one that is yet to come. Uh, you can't miss that that is, of course, seven, and we've already suggested that the language of verse 8 is the language of something that is trying to pass itself off as divine. And rather than it was and is and is to come, this thing was and is not and is to come for destruction. And it seems to me that this might be another indication of that, that it is an imitation 
of that which is divine and therefore fools a lot of people. I think that there is something else going on here that we might think about as well. Uh, in apocalyptic texts, it is actually quite common for the present time to be presented as a series of periods. And the, the author of such texts will usually say that we've only got one left or we're at the end of the last one, something like that. And that seems to be what John is doing here, that he has divided this up into a series of seven and says we're, we're almost at the end of this thing. And his point in saying that is that it's not going to last very long. Remember that John is writing to people who are going to be facing persecution. And they're going to want to know how long is this going to go on? Is this going to be a thing that lasts for thousands of years? Are my grandchildren going to have to suffer in this? And, and John writes to tell them throughout the book, God's going to deal with this wicked kingdom. It might not be in your lifetime, but it's not going to be 2,000 two years from now either. This kingdom's going to fall, and God's going to take it down. And relatively speaking, it's just going to be a little while longer until this thing is gone. And it seems to me that that is a very important part of whatever we say about this as well. That the evil of this kingdom is getting worse and worse, but it can only get so worse before God destroys it. And we're going to see in a moment that there is another text uh, in the Bible that is actually behind all of this. Um, and so that's uh, what I would make out of Uh, verse 9 and 10. All right, well, you can see it's a, it's a difficult text. Maybe you want to think about uh, what all of this means. Uh, but it gets worse. Um, verse 11. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth king. And this eighth one is one of the seven ones. And he goes to destruction. Okay, now our ability to count has been seriously altered because you count to seven and you get eight all of a sudden, and eight is somehow part of one through seven. So the beast is one of this sequence. Um, uh, John doesn't say if he's the first in the series, the last, or the middle one, or whatever. And... I, you know, I don't know if I have a definite interpretation of verse 11, but it seems to me that uh, it could be a reference to Domitian. That here is this man that has come along, that he has been popularly recalled or, or been popularly called Nero come back from the dead. Uh, he is a wicked man. He thinks of himself as divine. He wants to be worshipped as a god kind of all the things that are evil about Rome exist in this man himself, and it might be that that what, what's John, uh, what John is getting at here, that, uh, that there is a sense in which Domitian personifies the evil of the empire, that he is the beast in a sense, and the beast is one of these emperors. And so whether you want to call him the personification of Rome's evil, whether you want to call him number seven in the series, uh, John seems to be saying that there's a lot of ways to talk about this, but this evil character uh, is, is right around the corner. And of course, uh, we've suggested that this was written in John's uh, Domitian's day and that trouble was brewing on the horizon. Uh, that's about his as much sense as I can make out of verse 11 at the present. Maybe you have some other thoughts. Jim? Domitian is the last of the Julio Claudian. He's a Flavian emperor, isn't he? Yeah. The Flavians, yeah. The last of that. Right. That might be something to consider as well. It's kind of the last of that family line. All right. Um, on to the uh, ten horns. Verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Uh, John has been following Daniel chapter 7 here. Uh, the seven heads were in Daniel 7, 4 through 7, and the seven or the ten horns are also uh, from the vision of Daniel. So John, like he is doing with so many other things, is kind of 
reusing some imagery that has already appeared in the Bible, but using it now to describe another evil. Uh, and it is clear from the language here that John is referring to something that was yet future in his own day. They have yet to receive a kingdom when John wrote this, uh, but they receive authority as kings with the beast. Um, it seems to me the best way to understand this is a reference to what are called the client kingdoms of Rome. And as Thaxter pointed out, we don't need to go looking for ten of them. There were scores of them in the Roman Empire, but ten as a representation of the whole group of them. Uh, of course, Rome's policy was that when they conquered a kingdom, they left it in place. And they allowed the locals to continue to rule themselves and to enforce their own laws, but they were always accountable to Rome overall. And that fits very well with the picture that we get here, that they receive authority as kings with the beast. And so it seems to me, and this goes back to the comment that was made a moment ago, that we have here kind of a reflection of what's going on at the end of the first century and later, that it's not just Rome anymore, that Rome has become a collection of kingdoms. It has taken other kingdoms into itself, and these kingdoms are also going to be active in the exercise of Rome's power and authority as Christians view it as a, an oppressive force. And surely remember that John is writing to Christians not in Rome, but Christians in the province of Asia Minor where the emperor was worshipped. And I think what John is saying is that these other kingdoms that have come under Rome's control, they're going to be involved in this use of Rome's power as well. They're going to be part of this great oppression. And they have authority with the beast. But again, it's not something that's just going to go on and on and on. Just like we noted that sequence of seven in verse 10, is almost over. So John says, well, they will rise up. They will be kind of an adjunct to Rome's power, but for one hour. Uh, that's kind of like when we say for one second. An hour was the shortest measure of time that the ancients used. And so John's point is it's not going to last long. There's going to be this big attempt to consolidate and, and use all of this power, but it's not going to last because the city is going to fall. The kingdom, the, the, the empire is going to be judged. Uh, we're told more about them in verse 13 that these ten kingdoms, these client kings, have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. Um, they're going to be part of this opposition to the kingdom of God. And they're going to use whatever power they have for the furtherance of Rome's policies. Remember, emperor worship was most popular in the provinces. And it was important for these provinces to promote emperor worship to maintain good relations with Rome. And if there were people in their towns and cities like Christians who wouldn't worship the emperor, well, that was, that was something that they thought as a, of as a threat to their well-being. And so it seems to me John is describing here the, the intensification of the pressure that would be placed on Christians in these outlying areas. But the real explanation, it seems to me, comes in verse 14. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. I've said before, and I'll say again, that Psalm 2 is one of the most important psalms for the early Christians. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a, 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 a vain thing? The kings of the earth have taken their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us throw off his fetters, let us loose his shackles. God in heaven scoffs at them and says that you are my son, today I have begotten you, I have set you as a ruler over the nations. 
and you shall rule over them with a rod of iron and crush them like earthenware. You know that psalm very well about the world at war with God how the kingdoms of men don't want to be ruled by God. They don't want to submit to God. But in the end, God makes them submit. And he does so by making his Messiah, his son, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is exactly the language that John is using here. And that is the scenario that John is saying is working here. Now, I don't believe that... This is the only fulfillment of Psalm 2. I think there have been many fulfillments of Psalm 2. And there might even be some going on today. But there was a sense, as we've said before, in which kind of the kingdom of God and its struggle with Rome was the struggle. It was the defining struggle. Because if the church was going to last, it was going to have to be proven, and it faced its worst test at the very beginning of its existence in this great opposition from the Roman Empire. And so John says, can you see what's happening here? That the rebellion that Psalm 2 talked about has now come true in the Messianic age. But Psalm 2 also said that God would destroy that opposition, and that is exactly what he's going to do. He's going to destroy this wicked kingdom. Uh, They will wage war, but the Lamb will overcome them. Remember that the point, the emphasis is always on the victory. It might be that we have to kind of fumble around with the description of the the hardship, but the point is always, however you understand the hardship and the persecution, God's going to win. He's going to be victorious for his people. Uh, Verse 15, the explanation continues. He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. We suggested last time that that's a very fitting description of the Roman Empire that was spread out all over the Mediterranean basin, encompassing many different kingdoms and and peoples. Verse 16, the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. Interesting. How is God going to destroy this great wicked kingdom? We actually get a little bit of a glimpse into that here. Uh, God's not going to send an army from the Far East or from the West or from the North or something like that. You know, very often we look at the history of Rome and we say, well, was it the the invasion by the Goths and the Visigoths or the Vandals and, and people like that? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the explanation. That these kingdoms that had come under Rome's umbrella and that was sharing their power with Rome, these are the things that are ultimately going to destroy it. The ten horns that are the ten kings under Rome's control, these will make her desolate and naked. And so there's going to be a destruction from within not from without. Um, The language here, of course, is very familiar to us, desolate and naked. That is the language that is commonly used in the Old Testament as punishment for idolatry. Uh, We saw that in Isaiah. You see it in Jeremiah, that God says, not only am I going to punish Jerusalem, I'm going to lead its inhabitants into captivity naked. And there's a point to that. In humiliation, in shame, you're not going to go with your head held high, uh, proud and and, uh, strong. You're going to be like an animal, uncovered at your very worst, God says. And that's the language that is used here as well. It is used of the judgment on Babylon, uh, and uh, in Nahum, of course, it is considered to be a shameful, shameful thing when this happens. Remember, we're talking about the emperor cult, idolatry, men being worshipped as gods. It's therefore fitting that this language be used. And this idea of eating her flesh, uh, we get a bunch of this. Let's look for just a second at Ezekiel verses 25 down through 
27. Just about every image of destruction that Ezekiel can think of gets piled into that passage. And it goes on from there as well. See the same kind of thing in chapter 16. But it also reminds us of people like Jezebel, whom the dogs ate her uh, there in Jezreel. And what was Jezebel? One who promoted idolatry, the worship of Baal. And the idea of, of being eaten by the dogs, being treated like a piece of garbage, was, of course, in the ancient world, the ultimate degradation. That your body was considered to be just a piece of garbage for wild animals to eat, no burial, no honor, and so forth. And so God is using some very strong language here that that's what I'm going to do to this wicked harlot, which again is also a, a, a metaphor for Rome in her worldliness, her seduction, her idolatry, and all those things. Verse 17 then, we have one more difficult verse before we can finish. God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. Seems to me that John here is, is hearing a commentary on those things we just saw in verses 12 through 13 and saying that this is all part of God's providential plan. The nations are going to be doing God's will. And this, of course, is always an important part of prophecy. You see this in the Old Testament a lot. God says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do so that you don't get all upset when it happens. God says, I'm going to raise the Babylonians to power and then I'm going to use them to destroy the wickedness among my people. And then I'm going to raise up the Persians so that they can destroy the Babylonians. And, you know, if you didn't know that, you'd look at world history and say, man, things are just gone crazy. There's, you know, nation rising up, falling. But God says, I'm doing that. And that's the, the instruction that we get here as well, that God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose. And he's going to use their purpose to accomplish his purpose. It's one of the great things about the providence of God, that God can use what people do to do what he does. So, what does God have these nations do? He has them do what all nations do. What is it that they have as a common purpose? The greedy accumulation of power. One thing is true of every kingdom in the ancient world, they always wanted to be bigger. And this was true of the kingdoms that Rome took under its umbrella. They all wanted to be on top. That's why the Jews fought two wars with Rome. They didn't want to be under Rome's thumb any more than anybody else. They tried to revolt, and these kingdoms uh, of the rest of the world, uh, many of them were just like that. And so God says, I'm going to use their purpose. You know, they're kind of playing along with Rome right now because it's to their advantage to do that. Being cooperative with Rome makes them rich and makes them powerful. But the more powerful they get, the more powerful they're going to want to be. And this lust for power, God says, I'm going to use that to destroy the Roman Empire. And it will eventually destroy the harlot. And... Uh, it will wind up giving their, as they give their kingdom to the beast, it will ultimately result in the words of God being fulfilled, that is, the destruction of this empire. And then finally, verse 18, the woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth, which we've already identified as Rome. All right, well, we're out of time. The second bell is rung. Thanks for your good uh, attention tonight, as always.